Hello and welcome to the last lesson for Last Epoch University, at least for 1.0. And as is fitting, it is on Endgame. So let's go ahead and get into it. This is going to be all about what you need to know to get started with the Endgame in Last Epoch, what options are available to you, which are the Monolith of Fate, Dungeons, and the Arena. So we're going to go through each one of these one by one. And at the end, hopefully, you'll have a much better understanding of the activities that you have in the end game, how they work, what the rewards are, what the challenges are, so that you can make decisions about what you want to spend your time doing. Let's start with the Monolith of Fate, which is uh, really the main end game system in Last Epoch. This is the one that most players spend the majority of their time in. Now, it consists of what are consists of what are called timelines, and they each have their own web, their own bosses, and their own rewards. And there's standard and empowered versions. We're going to get into all what that means here very soon. Let's start with timelines. So this is what you first see when you go into the Monolith of Fate. You're going to see a map with these timelines. There's actually a physical place that you can be so that you can um, kind of travel it. Um, and each one of these little islands is a place that you're going to stop. And you're going to interact with a monolith in it that's going to open up a web of echoes. Echoes are our maps. We're going to talk about those in a second as well. So each of these little timelines, these little islands, are places where you'll stop and you'll open them up and you will do a, a, a web of effectively maps and your entire goal is going to be to eventually get to the unique quests and bosses of that timeline so that you can press, progress further into more difficult timelines and more rewarding timelines. Um, these bosses at the end reward you with exclusive blessings and uniques. Blessings are an item type. You'll, you'll probably remember it from the, um, the loot section that give you additional power or ability to farm things more efficiently. Of course, uniques are uniques and each boss has their own unique loot table. So there's quite a few rewards just from the standard setup of the Monolith of Fate. Uh, each timeline has static levels. So for example, the Fall of the Outcast is the first one that you will see, and it has a level 58 on it. You will progress through the timelines, starting at the bottom, which is the Fall of the Outcast, and you can go all the way to the top. You do that by, by uh, conquering the timelines before it. Okay, so we've mentioned the web, but what really is the web? When you enter a timeline, you will open up a web where echoes, which are maps, are selected. And it looks... Oops, excuse me, it looks, well, of course it doesn't want to work now. It looks like this. This is a web. So we start here, and if we were fresh, if we had just got in here, we'd only see a few options. But I've been in here for a little bit, and you can see these check marks are echoes, which are maps that I have completed. And I've moved forward, and as I've moved forward, I have opened up new pathways that I can go um, to try to go further out in the web, whichever way I want to. It's, it's completely up to me which way I want to go. But uh, I've just chosen to go out further because it's more valuable for me to do that for reasons we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but each of these little, little echoes here has um, a number of things going on with it. So for example, let's click on this one here. It has an enemy modifier. They all do. This one's as enemies have a chance to dodge. It's got the number three on it, which means this is going to be active for three echoes. Once I choose this, if I do this echo, it will be active for that echo and then two past it. You can see on the left side here, I actually have, um, actually, can you see that very well? Yeah, you can. Let me actually move my camera though, because you're not going to be able to see it for long. On the left side here, you can see these are the active modifiers that I currently have um, on my character or on my uh, this timeline. So if I go into an echo, these will go with it. But if I click this one, I'll get the chance to dodge as well along with the two player modifiers, the increased item rarity and experience gain, which also have three, so that also lasts for three echoes. And also the echo reward, which you can see on this little, little icon here. This is an arena key of memory. We'll talk about those later. It also rewards 24 timeline stability and up to 50 bonus timeline stability, which you collect that by killing monsters inside of the echo. So there's a lot of things that are going on with each one of these, and they all have you know different things. This one over here has an enemy modifier for chance to shred armor. It still has item rarity and XP that will always be on there, but it's going to be for six and how much it's going to give you is de dependent on how difficult that modifier, the enemy modifier is considered. 
And this one will actually give me a unique item as the echo reward, and then of course stability. And the stability actually goes up the farther away you get from the, the start point. So if we go up here, this is 28 and 58, this one's 32 and 66, etc. So that is the general concept of what, oops, excuse me. I will get this figured out. There we go. Of what a web is. So you select those maps, those echoes, you complete them, you get rewards and they add modifiers. Um, so that was the standard echoes I was showing you with modifier, the XP, etc. cetera. Um, item rarity does increase like the uh, likelihood of getting higher tiers and more fix fixes on craftable items that we saw there. We had, we had some, um, item rarity on this 23% increased item rarity. So that's what that's going to do for us. So that's an important part of scaling up the rewards that you get. So we get more of that. We get more XP. We get stability. Stability is going to um, be what we do to unlock the quest echoes. We're going to talk about that here in a minute too. Um, we talk about the predetermined reward. And at the end, once you finish an echo, there's also a reward chest that you get that is based upon how many enemies you killed in the echo. All right, that pretty much covers all the, the echoes. So there's quite a bit into even one single echo. Okay, so another thing that you have that isn't listed on that plate that, that I showed, but when you actually enter the echo, you will get an echo objective. This is what you have to do to, to complete the echo to be successful. You might get patrols, so it says kill two patrolling um, uh, Maruna ogres. Um, you might get a mini boss. You might get an arena echo, which is just do a certain number of waves, 12 to 17 waves of enemies in an arena map. You get spires. These things are going to attack you constantly and you have to go find them and destroy them. You get a time gate, which is something you have to go find, click on it, and then kill the enemies that come out. You can get ambushes, which are kill a certain number of enemies and then you will get ambushed and you have to kill them. And sometimes ambushes are actually hidden and um, uh, the game tells you it's a different objective and then eventually you kill enough enemies and actually know it's an ambush. So those are the objectives you can get. Uh, the reward types, we talked about this a little bit with showing the echoes, but there's quite a few of them. Here are some notable ones. You can get XP for completing an echo. You can get gold, you can get arena and dungeon keys. You can get shards, runes, and glyphs. If you're crafting materials, you can get uniques. You can get specific type uniques. Every timeline has a couple, one to two specific um, type uniques. For example, there's a timeline specifically for boots. There's a timeline specifically for helmets for uniques. Um, so if you're looking for, let's say, for example, you're looking for Herald of the Scurry, the helmet that turns your wolves into squirrels, very popular item, you would go to the timeline that has, has um, helmet unique specific echo rewards, and then you would, you would farm that there. That would be one way to target farm that particular unique item. And there, there are also echo rewards for specific type exalteds. These aren't connected to timelines the same way. That's random what you're going to get no matter what timeline you're in. But they do show up quite a bit, especially at higher corruption, which we'll talk about corruption in a minute. Um, so this is a good way to get a lot of exalteds. All right, so those are the standard echoes and the reward types they have. But there are also special echoes. So, um, for example, there are beacons, which reveal more of the web. There are vessels of memory, which reset completed echoes within their with their original rewards. So you went and you got a bunch of echoes, you did them. Let's say you got some with um, unique rewards, maybe specific unique rewards. You're farming that Herald of Scurry, and you had three or four nice echoes with, with helmet um, uniques. But you didn't get it, and if you do have a vessel of memory, you can go defeat the vessel of memory, and it will reopen all of those echoes that you did that have the unique helmet one, and it'll still have the unique helmet one. You can do them again. You can do this as many times as you find a vessel of memory on your timeline or on your web. A vessel of chaos will re-roll uncompleted echoes with new rewards. So maybe the uh, echoes that you have currently available to you aren't very good on rewards. You're looking for a unique helmet uh, rewards. There's none out there. Hit a vessel of chaos. Maybe they'll re-roll into them. That's all, that only counts for the ones that you haven't completed yet. And then there's the shade of Oribus, who's a very important special echo. He actually will reset your web, start it back to fresh, but he can add a corruption. It says add or remove has actually changed now. It does not remove corruption. There's a different thing that's going to remove it. I'll show you guys in a minute. But he'll just add corruption. And corruption is a way that you scale difficulty and rewards. So you'll increase the health and the damage of any, any enemies in the uh, Echo, including bosses. But you will also inc increase the item rarity and XP in doing so. He also has his own loot table of uniques that are oftentimes very desirable. He's got quite a few. 
that are valuable uniques. So people will farm him for both corruption and for his uniques. So let's just take a quick look at some of the, uh, let's see if we have some of these special echoes in here, just to show you guys what the difference is and how they look. So watch, I don't have any air. I do have a couple, okay. So this is the, um, the beacon. And what happens here is if I, if I were to complete this one, it would show a bunch of stuff in the area, a bunch of the other echoes farther out than a typical one would. So if I finish this one, it will show like one additional. This will show a bit farther than that. So you can kind of plan out your path a little bit better. And then this is the one where the shade shows up. So you can, you kill the shade. You can see here you get bonus, you get corruption, bonus corruption and gaze of orbs corruption is some diff, uh, extra mechanics on top of it. Uh, but you get corruption here and uh, doing so will reset your web, but you'll have additional corruption on it. So it'll make it a little bit more difficult. The other one I want to show you, which I don't have in my PowerPoint, but is important is if for some reason you have pushed, <clears throat> excuse me, if you pushed your corruption too far and you want to bring it back a little bit or even fully reset it, the Sanctuary of Aterra is where you do that. So you click on this, there's a, a, an area you go to inside of it. Tell you, you tell it how much corruption you want to remove. You kill some easy enemies and then your corruption is lowered. And so the fights will be easier. This is not generally used very much because corruption scales pretty slowly, but it is possible to a point where you're just like, this is harder than I want it to be. I want to bring it back. That's how you can do that. Okay. So that's special echoes. Let's move on to stability and quest echoes. So stability and quest echoes are hand in hand. Stability is what you need to do quest echoes. So you want to unlock quest echoes. There's three of them per timeline and you need to do them in order. So there's the first one, second one, third one. The third one is always the boss. The boss is what you need to do in order to move on and unlock other timelines. The bosses also have their own rewards. They have their uniques and they have their blessings and blessings are highly desirable, especially once you get to empowered timelines we'll talk about in a minute. So this is gonna be something you're gonna do a lot of. You're gonna be killing bosses a lot. The first time you enter the timeline, you're gonna be doing it to unlock other other uh, timelines. The first time you get to the, the monolith, you'll unlock other timelines by doing this, but you'll also go back to, to farm these bosses for their rewards. So they're a pretty important part of the, uh, the monolith of fate. So you, build stability by doing echoes get enough of that and then you do these quests you can build up enough stability to do all three at once so you can just wait till you have enough stability to do the first second and third together and then you can just knock them out or you can do them as they they unlock up to you i i personally wait or i yeah i personally wait and do them all, all together um once you have started these quest uh, timelines at or quest echoes at some point it's gonna give you an option to unlock additional timelines. So you will then choose that, unlock another timeline, and then you can go and do that timeline as well. Um, and once you conquer, conquer the Echo, of course, once you kill, once you kill the boss. Um, you can also unlock the one you didn't choose by rerunning the, the, the quests on that timeline. So timeline splits into two, you choose one of them, you can go back, you can do the timeline again, and then choose the other one unlock both both paths. Um, once you've completed the quest and the boss, the stability that you needed in order to do it will be lost. But if you had any extra, it will remain. So you can continue to do the same timeline over and over again, if you want to. The web does not reset. The only way to reset the web is through the Shade of Orbis. Um, so that's the mechanic that you don't have to worry about as far as the boss. You can kill the boss and keep progressing the web if there's other stuff you want. All right, empowered timelines are the next step up from for the models of fate and for regular timelines. Regular timelines are the first thing you're gonna run into, but eventually you're gonna get up all the way to the top of the the monolith, and there's gonna be three at the top. There we go. So here is our model of the fate and then at the top here you've got these three age of winter spirits of fire and last ruin the first time you're in here before you get to empowered you have to defeat all three of these and then once you've done that once you've beaten them all you go into the center here and you click the thing in the middle and it will unlock empowered for you so now you've got the harder version and the more rewarding version of the monolith so 
the difference between regular and empowered is that um, empowered are level 100 and they start at 100 corruption. We're going to talk about corruption in a minute. And you can increase corruption an unlimited amount when there's, a, there's actually a limit on non-empowered. So speaking of corruption, uh, for non-empowered, uh, it increases the area level of the timeline. So your level 58 one will actually increase a little bit if you kill the shade and add some corruption. Um, it will it will give them more enemy damage and health. This is multiplicative with any increased damage that you find in um, echo uh, modifiers. So you get a hundred percent increased elemental, and you have a hundred percent more from um, corruption. Those are multiplicative of each other, so it gets pretty powerful. Uh, increase XP and item rarity as you get more corruption, but it is capped at fifty percent corruption on non empowered. You can't go any higher than that. Unpowered starts at a hundred. Sorry, that shouldn't be fifty percent. That should be fifty corruption. It start it's capped at fifty corruption, and then empowered starts at hundred corruption. There's no cap, but there's no area level increase because you're already at level one hundred. Empowered is always level one hundred. So that's the difference between non empowered and empowered. Typically, players do not intentionally push non empowered corruption. Corruption is really a mechanic that comes into play almost exclusively in empowered for most players. You might incidentally kill a shade maybe to get more stability but typically people aren't trying to push that higher. Okay, there's some additional benefits of corruption as well. So it increases the stability per echo, which means you can continuously do the timeline boss more often, which you're gonna find is useful either for trying to get the blessing that you want and a higher roll of it, or for getting a unique that you want. There's some pretty rare stuff on there, especially if you're trying to get legendary potential. So this is going to be an important mechanic to push your corruption higher so you can do it more often so you have a better chance to get what you want. Some unique items also require corruption to drop or have an increased drop chance from higher corruption. So Omnis, for example, requires 200 corruption. I believe Apathy's Maw requires 50 corruption. Uh, Ravenous Void from Gaspar, it uh, has an increased chance of dropping from a gas part the more corruption you have. The total, of the highest it gets is still single digits. It's like 4% or something like that. So it never gets very high, but if you get high enough corruption, eventually you can farm it and get Ravenous Void. Um, and also rare timeline boss drops. There's every, every timeline boss has common and rare uniques, and rare ones become, they get higher chances of dropping and higher corruption. Okay, that's pretty much everything for a uh, month. I do want to talk about one thing actually, because I noticed it's not in here, but it's important. And it was um, something that we showed here. Let's uh, bring that back up. All right, and go back into here. And so we talked about the shade, right? And it increases corruption, but you may have noticed the bonus corruption and the corruption from the gaze of Orbis. So these are two mechanics that help you increase corruption faster and throughout different timelines. So the corruption that you gain is timeline specific, right? So I'm currently at the Reign of Dragons and I have 109 corruption here. That is 109 corruption on, on Reign of Dragons, but on a different one, I'll have something different. I'll have a different amount of corruption. So let's go here to Age of Winter. And this one, I have 100. I haven't, I haven't pushed this one at all. Um, this is actually a fresh character who's gotten to a power, so it's not really gonna have any corruption anywhere, but except for that 109, I think there's one other place where I probably have a little bit more um, anyway. So they all have different independent amounts. However, if you have, if you go into a timeline that's lower than your highest, you get like a catch up bonus. That's what the bonus corruption is. So it allows you to kind of keep them all higher faster. So you don't have to push them all from square one, um, which would take a very long time. So this is a very valuable thing. You can push one pretty high and then you can bring all the rest up to it pretty quickly. And then the corruption from Gaze of Oribus is actually from killing the timeline boss. It's not the shade, but the timeline boss. Every time you kill it, you gain a Gaze of Oribus. In this case, I actually have two Gaze of Oribus. You can see over here on the, on the left, which is going to offer me 18 corruption if I kill the shade. And I can keep stacking that if I want to, or I can kill the shade now, and I can get that bonus corruption. There is one caveat. If the shade kills me before I collect that Gaze of Oribus, I lose it. So that's a bit of a risk there. So, but, but it's a very good way of adding additional corruption by killing the timeline boss. Gives you another incentive as well to kill the timeline boss to increase your corruption. Okay, now we can move on into the dungeons. 
So the dungeons is an, a different end game system that um, is completely independent for the most part to the Month of Fate. There are currently three dungeons. There's a Temporal Sanctum, there's a Lightless Armor, and there's a Soulfire Bastion. Uh, each one requires their own specific key to enter. So Temporal Sanctum has a, a key, Lightless Armor has a key, you can't interchange them. You have to use the right key for the right dungeon. The easiest way to acquire these keys is actually from timeline bosses. So there is some interaction here with the Model of Fate. It's about as much as there is. Uh, you kill timeline bosses, they have a much higher chance of dropping uh, keys for both the dungeon and the arena, which we'll talk about later. Once you have a key, if you right click on it, it will show you where the dungeon's location is, making it very easy to find where the dungeon is on the map. Otherwise, it's kind of kind of a challenge. So just right click the key and it will show you where it is. And you can teleport there if you've been there already or find the closest place and walk to it. Uh, each dungeon consists of several things. They, there's, these are things that are consistent throughout each dungeon. They all have their own unique dungeon mechanic. They all have two floors with two doors to choose from to move on to the next. There's the first floor. There's two doors to choose from to go to the second floor. There's two door, doors to choose from to go to the boss fight. And the boss, there's, each one has their own boss, which also has their own unique loot table. There's also a reward mechanic that's specific to that dungeon. And there's rotating daily modifiers. This is true of every every dungeon. Actually, yeah, you think even, yeah, yeah, yeah they all have all these things. Yep, okay. Um, the dungeons also increase in difficulty from tier one to tier four, with tier one being the easiest and tier four being the hardest. Um, you must complete the lower tiers to attempt higher. I think Lightless Arbor actually has the first two tiers unlocked for it. I think that's the only one but typically you'll have to unlock the lower tiers to get to the higher tiers. Do note, tier one is extremely easy and tier four is very difficult. It is considered to be like baseline, pretty much the hardest content in the game. Those boss fights are gear and skill checks. So be prepared, expect to die quite a bit until you figure them out. And even when you do, they can still be pretty scary fights but uh, the rewards can be can be worth it in a lot of cases and also if you want to be challenged they will definitely challenge you all right let's talk about each individual one we'll start with temporal sanctum so the special mechanic for the for the temporal sanctum is time shift which allows you to travel between two separate timelines inside the dungeon. So the dungeon consists of um it's the same area but it's the it's uh, the the void timeline and it's also i think the imperial timeline um and and you can switch between the two at will with a button. I believe it's D by default. I've changed mine to three, but I believe it's D by default. So you can switch between these two and you're gonna to need to do that um, for a number of reasons, for two specific reasons. One is there's a lot of like barricades that are um, pseudo random. You need to use the shift, the, the time shift mechanic to get past the barricades. But also the boss is going to have a mechanic that requires you to time shift in order to effectively uh, avoid being exploded. So you're definitely going to need to learn how to use time shift. Um, the final boss for Temporal Sanctum also drops a unique with potential every time, at least one legendary potential, and an exalted that complements it. So if she drops like a unique ring, she'll drop an exalted ring as well. This guarantees you can create a legendary, which is important because this is also the only way to create legendaries is in the dungeon. The dungeon's special... Uh, reward mechanic is um, in fact making legendaries so once you finish the dungeon you're going to go to the eternity cache which is the next room you're going to open it in the divine era it's the divine era and the ruined era excuse me not that i said the imperial is the divine and the ruined era so those are the two time shifts you have so you go to the divine era use your time shift if you're not there already you place the unique with legendary potential in one slot and then you place an exalted with four affixes in the other slot, they have to be the same type. So ring for ring, one-handed X for one-handed X, etc. Then you press confirm, you switch to the Ruin Era, and you claim it by clicking on it, and you'll now have a legendary that will have some number of affixes off of the Exalted, depending on how much legendary potential you had on the Unique. Um, the other thing to know about Temporal Sanctum is it has some very powerful daily modifiers. For example, um, there's one, this, the enemies in the Temporal Sanctum are, I can't remember exactly the terms, but something like very likely 
or high, highly like have much a higher chance of dropping unique or excuse me exalted amulets that's very very powerful if you need an exalted amulets which at some point you will and so you can actually spend the entire day there farming exalted amulets and get a lot of exalted amulets um, so it's a, another option for target farming it is on a timer though it's daily and it, it can take a long time for it to show up but if that's something that's important to you you can check um tunk lab to see what the timer is and when that's going to come back up and there's a bunch of different ones you know the the, the amulet's just one of them let's talk about the lightless arbor dungeon now um the special mechanic for this dungeon is the burning amber which makes enemies vulnerable and burns pyres um if enemies are not in the burning amber which is just a effectively it's a fire that has light you know it emanates light if they're not in it they do consistently more or con con they do um significantly more damage and take significantly less damage so they can be much more dangerous when they're not in there i'm going to move my camera back down here there we go much more dangerous um and it's also used to burn pyres which is going to be necessary to get through the dungeon and to kill the boss there's a an area or the first part of the boss fight you need to put the burning amber on some pyres in order to actually finish the first stage of it the burning amber can be thrown or you can also stand next to things either one works uh, the dungeon reward for the lightless arbor is the vault of uncertain fate which is a gold sink so you will go up to it and then you'll begin to be offered modifiers to the vault um, things like adds chests with exalted items, adds uh, crafting materials to a chest, uh, du duplicates um, the items in chests. There's a lot of these, and you can spend a lot of gold in them because every transaction you make increases the gold cost, whether it be a reroll or an actual purchase of a modifier. It will continuously get more and more expensive, so it is very possible to spend millions of gold in there and create a loot explosion. And I do mean a loot explosion. You can basically fill the entire screen with loot if you spend enough gold in there and do it the right way so if that's something that you're interested in which it is a lot of fun to do and can be very rewarding this is where you would do that this also has the daily modifier system it's very similar to the temporal sanctum so you can check both of these and see what they're offering every day next up is soul fire bastion so the special mechanic for this dungeon is souls and what happens is enemies drop souls when they die and you can go collect them. And you use these for two things. For one, to gain fire or necrotic immunity and switch between them. The switch is kind of similar to how you switch between the two, um, the two time periods, the two timelines in um, Temporal Sanctum. In this case, you'll switch between fire and necrotic immunity. So you can be fire and then you can switch to necrotic and then back. Every time you do that, it costs one soul. Um, and you're gonna wanna use your souls at the end because it's a currency for the dungeon reward which is the soul gambler the soul gambler is a way to spend souls to gamble on items um these items are like boots belts etc it's like the other gambler except this one can do things like have exalts on it it can, it can give you uniques it can basically roll just about anything there's a few things it can't but just about anything um the door modifiers in this one will also alter the gambler's inventory and the gambling outcome so there's a lot of different ways it can alter it, including like the first thing you get is a unique. I think it's something, or I think maybe a percent chance to be unique. Um, we'll have a seal to fix on it, uh, et cetera. There's a, there's a lot of different um, modifiers you can do that will change the quality of the item you're gonna get out of it. It is possible to get very powerful items like this, but the RNG is poor. And so it's not generally used by players very much, but if it's interesting to you, give it a shot see what you do it is a solid option for farming exalted belts boots and gloves though which don't exist in the daily modifiers for the other two dungeons and there's of course there's no way to target farm exalted specific items in the monolith you can farm exalted but like there's no exalted belt echo reward doesn't exist so this is a good way to actually target them, or at least a solid way. I don't know if I would say good. It's a solid way. All right, the last endgame system is the Arena and the Arena of Champions. These are very similar, not quite the same, but we'll put them together because they're so similar. Uh, you access both of these by finding keys in the Month of Fate. Um, you can also find them in the dungeon. They can drop in the dungeon, but generally the Month of Fate. 
there are two types. There's the arena key, which for the standard arena will start you at wave one. And the arena key of memory, which will start you at wave 100 or half of your last run, whichever is greater. For the air arena of champions, both of these keys work and both of them do the same exact thing, which is just start the arena of champions. Um, so let's break up the two. Start with the standard arena, and then we'll talk about arena champions. The standard arena is pretty much what it sounds like. You're in an arena map and you kill waves of enemies. You'll kill five in a row, and then you'll rest. And you'll choose when to go forward. Every um, five waves, you can, you can choose. You can choose to continue or leave for very measly rewards. This is not a rewarding item-wise um, activity. Every 10 waves, the arena map changes and it gets increasingly harder as you go. Every five waves, it gets harder and harder and harder and it scales effectively infinitely. Um, it is mostly a measuring stick to compare yourself versus relative power of enemies or against others. That is really its primary purpose. It does include an online leaderboard for that, for that purpose. Um, it does offer drops in XP, but they are not good. This is not where you're going to want to go to level up or to get gear. You're going to want to do any of the other systems with that. The Arena of Champions is a little bit different. It is kind of like a dungeon. It has four tiers, just like the Dungeon Zoo, uh, with modifiers on them. Modifiers are added at the start. So when you put a key in, you get a modifier. Um, and also at waves 10, 20, and 30. And at those waves, you'll get to choose between two different modifiers. And this one ends at after 50 waves, which will include a boss fight. There are three, three, I believe, bosses that are um, just in the Arena of Champions. And they do have their own unique tables, which is a reason to do Arena of Champions if you want one of their uniques. Other than that, it is generally much less rewarding than either the dungeon or the month of fate so this is not something that players typically do for just general rewards even though it does offer them and certainly offers them in a way that's better than arena so it's an alternative thing that you could do if you want to but not highly efficient okay that covers everything there is to talk about for the at least baseline start of getting getting you going for for endgame there's obviously a lot more of these systems especially the month of fate there's a lot of strategy involved um a lot of depth in in that regard but this will at least get you going as far as what your options are and what maybe would be best suited for what you're looking to do i hope this really helps you and i hope you have a great time with the end game in last epoch um as of this recording we are six days out of 1.0 so looking forward to seeing you all at 1.0. I will be streaming all of the time at 1.0. Um, please feel free to hop in and hang out with us. But I also have a Discord if you want to ask questions or hang out with the rest of the community. Um, so please feel free to join us there too. Thanks again for watching. Hope you have a great time in Ellie. I'll see you all again real soon.